Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reinhard Schill. I'm from the University of Cape Town. And today I have the honor of presenting the paper Assessing the Impact of Social Grants and Inequality, a South African case study. And I'm presenting this on behalf of my fellow co-authors, uh, Murray, Murray Liebrandt and David Lamb. The purpose of this paper is to uh, investigate the expansion of the social grant system in South Africa post the fall of apartheid and the effect that's had on inequality, and to use this case study as an, exo uh, as an opportunity to compare income decomposition techniques across a variety of uh, techniques in order to gain insight into what these techniques can tell us and the advantages and disadvantages of the various techniques. So in order to cover that, uh, we'll be following the roughly the, uh, the, next, the following outline. First, we'll cover some introductory comments just to provide some context and background to the paper. Next, we'll uh, briefly discuss the data employed before continuing on to the analysis. In order, the analysis is broken down into three sections. First, we apply a static decomposition technique followed by dynamic uh, income decomposition technique, and then finally a uh, dynamic income decomposition technique uh, using simulations before concluding. This allows us to not only assess the impact of social grants on inequality in South Africa, but also allows us to put each decomposition technique against one another, or each other. Thus we can see what the effect social grants has had on inequality by viewing the issue through different lenses, and in doing so, learning something about the lenses themselves. Uh, since the transition to democracy in 1994, the South African government has dramatically expanded the, social system, uh, uh, the system of social grants in South Africa. Building on uh, the existing racially biased social grant system developed by the apartheid government, the new government instituted a variety of new grants, as well as increased the targeting of various grants. What this figure f effectively shows is that in 1993, oops, in 1993 uh, the percentage of income from the government was not that dramatic across all the deciles. However, fast forward to 1993, uh, to 2008, and we can see that the expansion of the social grant system, both in terms of the volume, in terms of the number of grants issued, and number of grants instituted, has dramatically increased over the, uh, across all deciles, and particularly for the poorer deciles, where the majority of their income is now uh, attributed to transfers from government. This shows uh, the impact that the uh, policy has had on poor, income, uh, poor individuals especially. Okay. The rollout or the expansion of the system has come through two avenues. Firstly, the institution of uh, the child support grant, which as we can see over the period, over the period of 1999 to 2010, has dramatically increased in expenditure and the number of uh, grants claimed. The child support grant is a grant targeted specifically at uh, low-income mothers who have children. In addition, the um, state all-day pension or the pension, which is targeted at uh, individuals who retire of Below, uh, over the age of 60, has increased to include individuals of all racial groups. So to assess the impact of these grants on inequality, we just briefly plot the distributions to give us a taste of what the situation is like. So in, 1990, in 1993, we can see that the income, uh, the total household income per capita, before uh, uh, taking into account grants, lies slightly to the re uh, left if we exclude the grants in total. This implies that for the uh, individuals at this end of the distribution, the grants for the, grant the social transfer system has greatly aided them. However, in 2008, we can do the exact same analysis, and we can see that there's a bigger shift when we include grants in comparing uh, total household income. So this gives an idea that, uh, as previously shown, that grants have mainly been helping the individuals at the lower end, and that the expansion in particular has made great strides in doing so. What is interesting now is to relate this back to inequality, we are curious to know what the impact of, inequality, uh, of these grants are on inequality or income inequality in South Africa. And so just looking at the distributions, one would expect that seeing that the distribution which includes income, uh, income from grants is narrower, you would expect that the grants have had some uh, equalizing effect in terms of income inequality as a whole. So in order to sufficiently assess the impact of these grants on uh, Inequality, we turn to, we require, we have data which we require two specific areas of. Firstly, we need data of two time periods, one before the expansion of the social grant system, and secondly, one post the expansion. And what we require of these, two peri uh, the, the, uh, these data sources is that they must have quite detailed information on the exact source of income, so that within a period we can decompose total household income into various buckets or various categories and assess how these buckets have been changing over time. 
And so, as a result, we turned to the Project for Statistics on Standard of Living, conducted in 1993, as our pre-democracy snapshot, and then using the 2008, 15 years later, National Income Dynamics Study to give us our uh, picture of South Africa, with, which would include the expansion of the social grant system. The Table 1 provides some uh, basic descriptive statistics on the total household income per capita and shows that pretty much the Gini coefficient has increased slightly, but not dramatically, and that despite the expansion of the social grant system, we do not see a decrease in inequality on an aggregate level. What we've done now is to, in order to assess the impact of social grants on inequality, we've broken down total household income into four buckets or four main categories to which to assess. Firstly, we look at household labor income per capita. Secondly, into the first social grant, the state's old age pension, as I mentioned, which was targeted at older individuals. Secondly, our, sorry, our third bucket is then government chances or other government chances, which would include this massive expansion in child support grant. And finally, any other income which individuals may have. So there's a couple of things just to point out uh, from the descriptive statistics, which gives us some insight into the situation. is a large share that labor income attributes to the total share of household income. Roughly across the period, uh, or with, in, within both periods, labor income makes up the vast majority of income of a household, and that's roughly at 60%. However, within labor income, there's quite large inequality in both periods. The expansion of the social grant system can be easily seen here when we look at the change of average from 3 to 28 in other government transfers, which captures this effect of the massive expansion in the, social, uh, in the child support grant over the period. What we can also see from these two is that the two government transfers has negative correlations with total income, which hints at the uh, means-tested nature of the grants in South Africa. So in order to assess what these grants have on inequality, we apply different lenses, or we look at it through different lenses in South Africa. And the first uh, decomposition technique that we use is the lerman tsuzaki approach. And what this approach does is it breaks down uh, the, inc the Gini coefficient, in particular, into three main drivers per component or per income category that we've used. So the first, uh, the first component over here is the correlation that the Gini coefficient has between, income, uh, between the income component itself and total uh, income. Secondly, it looks at the uh, Gini coefficient for each income source. And finally, it looks at the share of that particular source in, total income, in terms of total income. So collectively, what it's trying to capture is what is the inequality within a particular household income component, what is the inequality within that component, and how does that relate to income overall. This is a static approach, implying that it's only done within a particular period. And so using uh, the stock extension of the method, we can take the partial derivative of the approach to see what would happen if we change or if we increase a particular income component slightly within the period, and that is given by this formula over here. So here we can see our uh, results given the static income position uh, approach given here. And I'd just like to draw your attention to some, uh, some findings in particular. Firstly, we can see that labor income, or the income obtained from labor market activities, has greatly uh, resulted in an increase in inequality over time in the 1993 period. Uh, the two government transfers, uh, firstly the old age pension, as well as the other government transfers, which captures the child support grant, has resulted to a decrease in inequality within the period. But because this is a static uh, decomposition uh, approach, we have to do it for both 1993 and 2008 separately and contrast the results across the two data sets. So in 2008, we can see that once again, labor has had quite a large disequalizing effect. And in comparing this to the 1993, we can see that its disequalizing effect has somewhat increased. Interestingly enough, the old age pension in 2008 has a disequalizing effect. This is sort of counterintuitive. You would expect that a grant would have uh, an equalizing effect, but this is not the results that are obtained from the static uh, decomposition in the 2008 period. However, other government transfers re keeps, uh, remains somewhat equalizing, although the, co uh, the number is quite dramatically small. Yeah. However, the main disadvantage that the, uh, the static approach has is its one-dimensionality, as it provides a snapshot of the drivers of income inequality in a particular period, and so it's quite limited in assessing how these things change over the course of the period in question. And so we move on from a static decomposition technique to a dynamic decomposition technique, which explicitly takes into account 
the change in the, uh, in the Gini coefficient. So that we can assess how changes in each income decomposition technique has affected the change in the Gini overall. So what the WAN approach does is that it calculates first the concentration index of a particular co uh, component as well as the share of the component of total income. And using these two, divides them into three separate categories. The first category, which is outlined over here, is labeled uh, the structural effect, which mainly captures the effect of changes in shares of income on the change in Gini coefficient. The second is how the change within a component inequality affects the change in Gini, and that is kept, uh, named the real uh, inequality effect. And then finally, over here, is how changes in both effects affect the change in Gini, and is appropriately labeled the interaction effect. Applying the WAM approach, the D, uh, dynamic decomposition approach, to the South African data, we obtain the following results. I draw your attention to the final column here, the full contribution. Effectively, you can see that labor income has had quite a positive, which re uh, represents a disequalizing effect on in uh, income inequality over the period. The two government transfers both indicate negative effects, which shows that they are quite equalizing. In fact, they have reduced income inequality over the course of the period, and that other income has also related, has resulted in a disequalizing effect. So in essence, what we capture is, is that the changes in the, in, uh, in the Gini coefficient over the period has been driven mainly by labor income, and that the two social grants, or the two buckets of government income that we've created, has, result, would have result, uh, has resulted in a decrease in income inequality. However, there is a disadvantage of the WAN approach, and is that, that it doesn't isolate the exact impact of a change in income inequality. In an ideal situation, we would like to compare the extension of the social grant system over the period, uh, over the period between 1993 and 2008 to a counterfactual situation. In essence, we would like to look at how the 1993 social grant system would operate in the 2008 world. So a novel approach by Barros tries to create this counterfactual, which we can use as a comparison, uh, by basing it on a series of simulation. So similar to the previous uh, approaches, we can divide uh, per capita household uh, income into two broad uh, into various categories. So just for illustrative purposes over here, I've just broken it down into government income and non-government income, while the analysis breaks it down into our original four components. Right. Then assuming, uh, letting F be the uh, the cumulative distribution function of uh, income, which is then dependent, of, uh, of course, on these two components. We can calculate any welfare indicator which is based on some function of the distribution, cumulative distribution as a whole. So in essence, what the approach does is that it plays around with these components in calculating the various effects. And so to give you like an illustrative example, uh, well, let me take you through the technique. Uh, firstly, the indicator is calculated as it is for the 2008 period. Okay. Then subsequently, uh, the indicator is recalculated, but one particular component is changed. So in essence, uh, the 1993 component for non-government income is substituted into the, income, uh, into the cumulative distribution function of the 2008 income, and then the, in uh, the inequality figure is recalculated. The difference between the 2008, which contains only 2008 components, and then uh, 2008, which includes the one component, which is 1993, then gives us the impact of these two, uh, of the change of that particular co uh, component across the period. So let me talk you through this in a bit more of a practical example. Firstly, we, uh, households are ranked according to their, uh, can be ranked according to either their value in the total income all by the values within a particular component. And then we calculate the Gini coefficient for to the 2008 period. Then we swap, we aim to recalculate the 2008 Gini coefficient, but by swapping one component within its 1993 value. And the way this is achieved is by doing it within quantiles. So if a household is ranked in 2008 in a particular quantile, we replace that value with its 1993 counterpart and then recalculate the, curve, uh, the Gini coefficient. And the difference within it gives us the impact of that, the change in the component. So in essence, we capture what would have happened if that 1993 so, uh, component was operating in the 2008 world. Uh, this technique is quite useful because it tries to aim at that capturing the counterfactual, uh, which we are looking for. But it also gives us, allows us to make two additions to the such, uh, such, uh, situation. 
Firstly, we can, take into, we can explicitly take into account uh, uh, household composition changes. So in particular, how we can break down this equation over here into a more detailed equation which allows us to take into account household decomposition, such as the number of individuals the number within our household, the number of adults within our households, and the number of employed individuals within our household. So you can see how changes within our household itself, or how households change, has had an effect on uh, income inequality. Secondly, because this technique is highly based on re-ranking of, or the ranking of the distribution and substituting across the time period, we can rank individuals and do the substitution based not only on total income, but also on income components itself. And so we can see how changes in the distribution of a particular income component has had an impact on inequality. And this is particularly useful with regards to social grants, which uh, basically relates to how targeting or the change in targeting within some particular social grants has had an impact on inequality. And so just applying the simple approach over here, without taking into account the uh, household decompositions or the re-rankings, we get the following results. For our four categories, we can see that labor, the changes in labor over the period, has contributed to an increase in the Gini coefficient, similar to our previous approaches. Secondly, the states the change in old age pension grant from the government has resulted in a slight increase in uh, inequality over the period. However, transfers, other uh, transfers from the government, which mainly captures the child support grant, has dramatically resulted in a decrease in inequality over the period. Over here, we do the more nuanced approach where we take into account changes in household composition, as well as try and aim at affecting how changes in targeting in a particular grant system or the distribution changes, which we change through the re-ranking, is obtained. So just first focusing on household composition, we can see that as the share of adults has changed over the period, it has resulted in a slight increase in inequality or income inequality within the, uh, across the period. However, the share of individuals, the share of the proportion of adults that are employed has resulted in a decrease in inequality. Total labor income has similarly, uh, using this more advanced technique, which now takes into account uh, household composition, we can see that labor income actually results in a small change in income, uh, a small decrease in inequality across the period. The old age pension, once again, as our previous results have suggested, has somewhat resulted in a disequalizing effect across the period. While other government transfers, our second grant has left to a decrease or an equalizing effect across the period. So finally, just to conclude and wrap up what these three techniques have shown us, not only about South Africa, but also about themselves, we can see that each of these techniques often takes a different approach in trying to answer the exact same question, either through explicitly accounting for the dynamic nation across the period, or by explicitly accounting for a counterfactual situation, which allows it to contrast or isolate the effects. The dynamic decompositions would seem to, have to offer more in terms of looking at the impact of social grants and inequality, especially decomposition techniques that consider the impact that changes in household composition has on uh, changes in real income value across the period. Still, uh, we're not getting much traction as we'd like to see, given that those densities initially showed a decrease in the distribution that we had at first. Thank you.